Those of you just joining, welcome. We are just going to give it a few more minutes and give everybody an opportunity to join and then we will get going in about another two or three minutes. All right, I know we might still have a couple of stragglers, but I'm going to go ahead and get us all started today. Thank you all for joining us. Um, our webinar today is on commonly confused modifiers. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule and uh, know just how important your time is. So again, thank you so much for joining us. I'd also like to say thank you to Pekka for giving us the time to conduct this session with you today. We're excited to share information on some of the most frequently seen and misunderstood modifiers in eye care. As we go along today, please note that all participants will be muted. However, please feel free to use the question section to ask any questions that you have along the way. We will have a Q&A at the end. Additionally, please note that the session will be recorded and we will send out the slide deck after the webinar, so you will have a copy of it to refer back to. My name is Melissa Jacobson, and I am the Operations Manager for RevCycle Partners. I am responsible for our team of billers that delivers our billing service on the Revolution EHR platform. I have been with RevCycle Partners since early 2019. Prior to that, I spent 12 years running a 10 location optometric practice in Northeast Florida. I actually started there as a technician and worked my way up to COO for the organization. So I have a pretty unique perspective, I believe, um, that helps me in my role and hopefully will give me an opportunity to share quite a bit of knowledge with you guys today. With me, I have Danielle Kiger. Danielle, would you like to take a moment to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, my name is Danielle Kiger. I'm a group manager with RevCycle Partners. I also assist uh, with a team of billers and, and work accounts. 
I've been with RevCycle Partners since early 2017. I've worked in the eye care industry, however, since 2008 um, in various positions from technician, contact lens technician, um, lab manager, um, vision billing specialist, many different hats. Um, so hopefully uh, we'll be able to help with any questions today as well. Very good. So we actually have a list of about 10 modifiers that we will be discussing today. For each of these modifiers, we are going to go through a definition of the modifier, give you some ideas on when you can use it, perhaps when you should not use it, and then also give you an example of proper use. Certainly this list is not all inclusive. It's not all modifiers that exist, nor even all modifiers that eye care uses. But we do believe that this it's the most commonly used ones and or really the ones that you need to be most aware of or that might trip you up the most. So let's go ahead and get started. We're going to start first by discussing what a modifier is. Um, so modifiers are used to provide additional information to insurance companies regarding the procedure, the service, or the item that has been rendered. There are pricing modifiers, informational modifiers, and location modifiers. Appropriate use of these modifiers ensures that the provider is paid correctly for their time. They give the payers additional information about the procedure, the service, or the supply without changing the code itself. It allows us as billers and coders to kind of expand our, you know, um, database of codes without actually adding more codes. So modifiers are two characters in length and can be all numeric just alpha characters or alpha numeric. They get added to the claim form in box 24D and should be in the general order of pricing modifiers first, followed by informational modifiers, and then finally by location modifiers. You can have just a single modifier on a claim line or you can have multiple on a single claim line. Again, they're just adding some additional information about the service. Knowing which modifier to use and when will not only ensure the accuracy of your reimbursements, but will also help protect yourself from the risk of audits. Overuse of particular modifiers will often throw a red flag with payers and will result in payer audits. So let's give you the details that you will need, the information that you will need to be able to correctly and appropriately use modifiers to communicate additional claim info. 24, this is an informational modifier. This modifier is used on ENM codes to indicate that the service was performed by the same physician during a post-op global period. In other words, a patient was seen during a post-op or global period for an issue unrelated to that post-op global period. The ENM code will be listed on the claim with a modifier 24. As a reminder, ENM codes are your 99 codes. You also can also use your um, I codes, your 92002 to 92014. You should make sure that your chart notes are very clear when it comes to modifier 24. The chief complaint, the exam, the assessment and plan all need to talk to the problem and demonstrate that it is not related to the surgical procedure for which the post-op or global period is dictated. The region of the eye being addressed needs to be a different region than where the surgery was done or at least the service needs to be for an added course of treatment, which is not part of the normal recovery from surgery. If there's a new symptom or a significant change requiring an evaluation of an unrelated problem or the fellow eye, modifier 24 would be appropriate to use. Understand though, that when modifier 24 was created, it was anticipated to have very low use. As a result, payers are sensitive to it. 
Some may even automatically deny the claim just because modifi modifier 24 is on it. Doesn't mean it's wrong. So if you believe that you have a claim that has been denied incorrectly, if you believe the circumstances are met for modifier 24, you should appeal it, state your case for why the visit was required, why it was unrelated to the surgery. And then, you know, even if the payer does pay on the claim, be prepared for the payer to request a copy of your records to justify the use of modifier 24. Payers are very sensitive to claims that include this modifier. So here's an example. A patient has had cataract surgery, let's say two months ago. So they're in the global period for the surgery. You know, post-op care for cataract surgery is 90 days. In this case, the post-op care is being co-managed by the optometrist. Two months into that 90-day global period, the patient comes into the office and is seen by the same optometrist that's providing that post-op care for a glaucoma checkup. Since the patient's glaucoma is not related to the cataract surgery in any way, the e &M code for the visit should have a modifier 24 attached. As you can see in this example, box 24D lists 99213 with modifier 24 in the first modifier position, immediately following the CPT code. Again, chart notes should be clear that the visit was ordered prior to the cataract surgery and that the findings, such as increased IOPs, are not related to the surgery or other post-op care. The chief complaint or reason for visit needs to be clear and should not mention the two-month follow-up for cataract surgery. It needs to be clear it was unrelated. So if that's an example of appropriate use, what is inappropriate use? Well, you should never use modifier 24 if the reason for visit is considered post-op care or related to the surgery. You can simply ask yourself, if the patient had not had surgery, would this problem exist? If the answer is no, then don't use modifier 24. Keep in mind that a new diagnosis does not necessarily mean unrelated. A complication from the surgery may result in a new ICD-10, but it is still related to the surgery. So again, ask yourself that question. If the patient had not had the surgery, would this problem exist? Items covered under routine post-op care that do not justify modifier 24 are treatment for surgical complications that do not require a return trip to the operating room, E&M visit related to the patient's recovery, pain management, dressing changes, incisional care, and removal of sutures. So modifier 24, again, would not be used if you're treating or taking care of one of those things. Modifier 24 is also not appropriate when the patient is admitted to a skilled nursing facility for a condition related to the surgery. And again, modifier 24 is only used during the post-op or global period. If the unrelated service occurred on the same day as the surgery before the post-op period begins, you would not use modifier 24. Instead, modifier 25 is likely appropriate. So let's talk about modifier 25. So modifier 25 is an informational modifier used to indicate an e &M service performed is unique from a procedure performed on the same day by the same physician or other qualified healthcare professional. So as an example, a glaucoma check performed at the same time as a foreign body removal. It is important to be careful when using as it can be a red flag to insurance payers. This modifier is only used on e &M services and should not be added to surgical procedures or tests. If a modifier is needed for a surgical procedure or test, modifier 59 or 79 may be appropriate. And we will discuss both of these in upcoming slides. It is also important with this modifier to have a clear charting and notes to show that the ENM service is for a separately identifiable and unrelated reason than the procedure being performed. A separate diagnosis is not needed per Medicare 
However, documentation must be in place to justify the separate service. Payers have been known to request copies of exam notes when modifier 25 has been used. So if you, know, you feel a claim has also denied inappropriately when you have used modifier 25, it's important to file an appeal with the payer and you may want to include documentation showing the necessity of the e &M service that was performed. Here's an example of modifier 25 being used. Um, as you can see, a patient is being seen for a glaucoma visit and foreign body is found during the visit. Both the ENM service for glaucoma and the foreign body removal should be reported. The ENM portion would be reported with modifier 25, indicating the visit was for a separately identifiable reason than the procedure that was performed during the visit. If the patient were coming in for the feeling of something in the eye, or eye pain, modifier 25 would not be used. The driver behind modifier 25 is the reason for visit. What is the purpose of the visit? Was the patient scheduled for their annual exam and something significant was found and treated? Were they presenting with the issue or scheduled for a follow-up for the purpose of a minor surgical procedure? If it is a scheduled procedure and no other issues present, it is not appropriate to use modifier 25. It is important to make sure to answer this question in the charting to help ensure proper coding and documentation is in place if the payer requests additional information. There are times when modifier 25 wouldn't be used. Modifier 25 does not need to be used if there was no minor surgical procedure performed, so it does not need to be used when services such as OCT or fundus photos are performed with an e &M service. If the service being performed is related to a prior surgery during the post-operative period, modifier 25 would not be applicable as the service would be considered as part of the global surgery period and covered under the original surgical claim. If the patient is a new patient, since they're being seen for the first time, modifier 25 would not be used if a minor surgical procedure is also performed. The new patient e &M code is exempt from bundling in this instance these codes are paid separately from the minor surgical procedure codes. On any codes other than the ENM codes, it should not be used. You would never append to a testing service or surgical procedure. Modifier 25 is sometimes confused with modifier 59. A good way to remember is modifier 25 is only to be used with the ENM services, while modifier 59 should not be used for ENM services. Again, we will discuss modifier 59 in more detail in a few moments. Next, let's review modifier 26 and TC. Modifier 26 and TC go together. Um, 26 represents the professional component of a service, the interpretation of a test that was performed, while TC represents the technical component of the service, the performing of the test without the interpretation. Both of these modifiers are considered pricing modifiers and should be reported in the first modifier position. When reporting, the payer will split the fee for the entire test based on their fee schedule and the modifier that was used. These modifiers can only be used on services that are listed with a one in the PCTC field of the Medicare physician's fee schedule. Some examples of services that modifier 26 and TC could be used with are visual fields, OCTs, and fundus photos. This is a great example of the use of modifier TC and 26. We can see that a patient was seen on August 12th for a visual field, but was not seen by a provider at this time. Due to this, the claim is reported with modifier TC, showing only the technical component was performed. And you know, there's only one modifier there and it's listed in that first position. In example B, we can see the doctor provided the interpretation and report of the service performed on August 19th. Since the test was performed on a different day than the interpretation and report, modifier 26 is being used. If both the interpretation and report as well as the test were performed on the same day by the same provider, modifier 26 and TC would not be used. Reporting the test without the 26 and the TC modifiers indicates that both portions were performed at the same visit and by the same provider. 
when should we not use modifier 26 and TC? If the service is listed as anything other than a one in the PCTC column of the Medicare Physician's Fee Schedule, these services do not qualify for a split in professional and technical components or may have no technical component available to split. If both the professional and technical component of the service were provided by the same provider on the same day, you would not split these. You would not want them on your claim form separated. You would want them just on one line together with no modifier. On E&M e codes, 26 and TC should only be utilized on testing codes. Next, let's review modifier 50. All right, so modifier 50 is a payment modifier, and it is used to communicate that a bilateral procedure was done on both sides of the body, so additional money should be paid on the claim. When a procedure that is typically considered unilateral is done bilaterally, payers allow for the second instance to be paid as well as the first by using modifier 50. Instead of paying 100% of the allowed amount, using modifier 50 is requesting that the payment be 150% of the allowed amount. The second instance of a typically unilateral procedure will also, I'm sorry, will always be paid at 50% of the allowed amount when done on the same day or visit as the first instance. Because this is a payment modifier, it should be reported in the first modifier position. To know if a procedure qualifies for potential use of modifier 50, the bilateral surgery indicator needs to be one. You can see the bilateral surgery indicator on the physician fee schedule relative value file that's found on CMS's website. Many of the surgery codes or 6000 codes that iCare uses are examples. If the procedure has a bilateral surgery indicator of one and you perform the procedure on both the right and left side at the same day or visit, you should append modifier 50 to the claim line. Thus, in order to understand if you should be using modifier 50, you really need to be comfortable with looking up the CMS fee schedule and identifying the payment policy indicators. So you can access the fee schedule by navigating to this link that's provided here on this slide. As you can see in the example that's provided for 67820, you'll want to search for the payment policy indicators as your type of information. You'll input, input the procedure code in your HCPCS code box and then click search. Once you get your search results, you're going to find the column that's related to the bilateral surgery indicator. It's abbreviated BILT, S-U-R-G. You will look in that column and try to see what the surgery indicator is. If it is a zero in that column, that indicates that the code is a unilateral code and modifier 50 is not billable. A one as we said, indicates that modifier 50 can be appropriate in some circumstances. A two indicates that it's a bilateral code and modifier 50 is not appropriate. A three is usually indicative of radiology codes and modifier 50 would not be billable. And then a nine indicates that the concept does not apply. Those are usually your office visit codes. So again, you're looking in that bilateral surgery code and looking for an indicator of one. So here's our example. A patient has been seen for a dry eye check. While in office, trichiasis has been identified in both eyes. When looking up epilation in the physician fee schedule, as we just saw, procedure code 67820 does have a bilateral surgery indicator of one. Thus, since epilation was done on both eyes during the same day or visit, 67820 is reported one time on the claim form with modifier 50. That's key. You want one line and the price should be 200% of your normal UNC. This is very unusual for this modifier. So take note, you want the UNC to be 200% of your, I'm sorry, you want the build amount to be 200% of your UNC. 
So in this example, an epilation would typically cost $85, but because this was done on both eyes, the price has been doubled and it's being billed at $170, still with one unit. Using modifier 50 in this circumstance, we'll be requesting payment of 150% of the allowed amount. Again, be careful. It's critical that you adjust your build amount to be 200% of your normal UNC. If you forget to adjust your build amount, you may lose out on reimbursements since you will be paid the lesser of the build amount or 150% of the allowed amount. You would not report 67820 on two lines with RT and LT. Also, of, as a side note, since the trichiasis was not the reason for visit, you can still bill the ENM code, as mentioned earlier, by using modifier 25 on that particular line. Now, from any procedure that has a bilateral surgery code of anything other than one, that would be your indicator zero, two, three, or nine, you would not use modifier 50. Those procedures don't qualify for the use of modifier 50. Also, if the bilateral surgery code is one, do not use modifier 50 if you're performing the procedure on different areas of the same side of the body. For example, most payers consider epilation payable by eye, not the lid. When epilation is payable only per eye, not per lid, if you remove eyelashes from the upper and lower right lids, you would not bill modifier 50. If the procedure code is described as, quote, unilateral or bilateral, end quote, in its CPT description, such as fundus photos, that also does not qualify for the use of modifier 50. And keep in mind that modifier 50 is basically replacing the need for RTLT. You would not need to report modifiers RT and LT when you are using modifier 50. So let's talk about modifier 55 next. Modifier 55 is a pricing modifier that indicates only the post-operative care is being performed by a provider. Generally for optometry, this is for post-operative cataract services. A patient can request that the surgeon only see them for a portion of the post-operative period, at which time they are transferred back to the referring provider for the remaining follow-up visits, or the surgeon may be unavailable for post-operative care. When the transfer occurs, a transfer of care document with all of the needed information for the claim is provided to the referring provider. The provider would then bill for services after the first follow-up visit with the patient using modifier 55, letting the insurance payer know that the post-operative care is split between the surgeon and the provider. The provider's claim must match the surgeon's claim with diagnosis, CPT, and transfer of care dates in order for the insurance to properly process the claim. The amount the insurance allows as payment is based off of the number of post-operative days each provider is responsible for within the post-operative period. It is important to note that any visit related to the post-operative care or surgery during the global period is included under the claim for the original post-op care and is not billed separately. So as an example, if you're seeing a patient for one day post-op and one week post-op, the one day post-op does include all of the uh, post-ops that would follow. You wouldn't bill for each of them separately. As this is a pricing modifier, we will want to report this modifier in the first modifier position. As can be seen in this example, modifier 55 is added to the cataract surgery code in the first modifier position to indicate only post-operative services were performed. The surgeon would bill with a modifier 54 to let the insurance know they provided the surgical services and would also possibly bill with modifier 55 for any post-operative care they provided. When using modifier 55, the date of service will be listed as the surgery date, no matter the date the patient was seen for their first follow-up visit with the care dates 
being listed in box 19. So the surgery date here is listed as December 21st, but in box 19, you can see it says December 28th through March 21st. Those would be the dates that um, you're seeing or responsible for the care of the patient. Modifier 55 works hand in hand with modifier 54, which is why it is important that when using modifier 55, the insurance claim matches the details of the surgeon's claim, information which should be obtained from the transfer of care document from the surgeon or surgical center at the time of transfer. Modifier 55 is not appropriate to use in a situation in which you're not providing any post-operative care for the patient. If you have performed the surgery and will be seeing the patient for all follow-up visits, then no modifier is needed other than possible location indication modifiers. Any other code than a surgery code, modifier 55 would not be used. It should not be added to ENM or testing codes. Next, we'll be discussing modifier 59. Okay, so modifier 59 is used to unbundle procedures and indicates that a procedure is a distinct procedural service. In 2015, the X modifiers were added to give more details than modifier 59, explaining further how and why the procedure is distinct. So we're gonna talk about modifier 59 and the X modifiers together. If you are unbundling the procedure, because they, are, because they occurred at separate encounters on the same day, you would use modifier XE instead of 59. If the procedures should be unbundled because they were done on separate organs or structures, you would use XS. XP is used to indicate that the services are distinct because they were done by separate practitioners. And XU is for when the services do not overlap the usual components of the main service. Medicare's National Correct Coding Initiative includes claim edits that bundle certain codes. These codes are bundled as a result of coding policies based on coding conventions defined in the AMA CPT manual, national and local Medicare policies and edits, coding guidelines developed by national societies, standard medical and surgical practice, and or current coding practice. However, under certain circumstances, a provider may unbundle some of these codes to bypass the edits and request payment for both services that would otherwise be considered mutually exclusive. To know if codes can be unbundled, you will want to look them up on the NCCI table. If there is a one in the modifier column, modifier 59 may be used if the circumstances warrant it. So modifier 59 and modifier X are used to bypass edits that have been in place by Medicare's National Correct Coding Initiative or the NCCI. Warranted circumstances that qualify for modifier 59 or modifier X may be a different session or patient encounter, different procedure or surgery, different site or organ system, separate incision or excision, a separate lesion or separate injury not ordi ordinarily encountered or performed on the same day by the same physician. If you feel that the circumstance qualifies, you should append modifier 59 or the correct X modifiers to the CPT code that is listed in column two on the NCCI table. That is, as long as there isn't another more applicable modifier. If there is a more descriptive modifier apart from 59 or X that can be used, do so instead. One example of mutually exclusive procedures is the OCT and fundus photos. Sometimes an office may need to unbundle these codes. When that happens, modifier 59 should be used. Just be careful. CMS considers the treatment of the posterior segment structures in the eye to be treatment of a single anatomic site. 
Not to say that it can't be justified, but just be prepared that if you are going to unbundle any mutually exclusive procedures, you need to have your chart notes and documentation to back up your reasoning. Modifier 59 and X only apply to non ENM procedures. They should not be used with ENM services. If you look up the NCCI table, you will only find non ENM procedures listed in the table. Modifier 59 and X should never be used unless the criteria has been met to unbundle the procedures. Again, this needs to be a different session or patient encounter different procedure or surgery, different site or organ system, a separate incision or excision, a separate lesion, or a separate injury. Modifier 59 and X should never be used with each other as well. Keep in mind that modifier X is basically providing additional information that modifier 59 does not. If you don't feel that one of the X modifiers accurately describes the circumstance, you can use modifier 59. Now modifier 59 and X are the most widely used modifiers, but also believed by CMS to be the most widely abused or misused. They're highly audited as a result. So it's even more critical that you understand them and use them correctly. Modifier 59 should never be used to simply bypass in CCI edits. Know that by definition, the edit is in place because coding conventions, guidelines, and practice say that the procedures should never, or at least almost never, be done together. If you are going to unbundle mutually exclusive codes, make sure your chart notes are clear and complete. There's a high risk of audits with modifier 59. You need to explicitly document how the procedures are distinct, such as them being a separate encounter or structure. Okay, modifier 79. Um, this is another cataract post-op modifier. Its definition is an unrelated procedure by the same physician during a post-operative period. It is an informational modifier, most commonly used in optometry when cataract surgery is performed on the other eye during the global period of the surgery for the first eye. This modifier must be used if within the global of the first eye in order for there to be payment. Each eye has a separate global period, and it is important to remember when a patient is in the post-op global period to ensure proper modifier usage on any claims that occur within that period. As it has been previously discussed, all visits related to the post-op care of the patient within the global period fall under the original claim. If the visit is unrelated to the post-op during the global period, other modifiers may be appropriate. The global surgery calculator is an invaluable tool to help calculate the global periods of surgeries to help ensure proper modifiers are utilized when creating your claim. It can be used to calculate the global period for both 10-day global and 90-day global. In our example, with the postoperative cataract surgery follow-up, the 90-day global period calculator is what we will be using. This is a great example of modifier 79 usage. Since we are aware the right eye surgery was performed on December 10th, the global period for that surgery using the global surgery calculator lets us know that it would run until March 10th. The surgery on the left eye was performed on December 21st, which is during that global period of the first eye. Due to this, Modifier 79 needs appended to the claim to speak to the post-operative service being for an unrelated surgery. You can see in box 19 that the global surgery period for the second eye runs until March 21st. As a reminder, each surgery's global period are considered separately. Using this example, if the surgery for the second eye occurred after March 10th, then modifier 79 would not be used as it would be outside the global surgery period of the first eye. 
In this instance, the claim would be submitted without the 79, but would still include modifier 55 and either the right or left modifier. Modifier, next slide. Modifier 79 should only be used with surgical codes, never ENM codes or testing services. If the procedure is directly related to the original surgery, modifier 79 would not be appropriate as it is only for a separate unrelated procedure. If the second procedure is outside of the global period of the first procedure, then modifier 79 does not need to be used. Utilizing the global surgery calculator can help determine if the procedure is within the global period of the original surgery. Next, let's discuss modifier GW. So modifier GW is a much simpler modifier. It is not very complicated, but it is often overlooked. When a terminally ill patient is in hospice care, they waive all rights to Medicare Part B payments for services that are related to the treatment and management of their illness during the period the hospice benefit election is in force. It's not completely uncommon for hospice patients to still need eye exams and eyewear. If you render services to a patient in hospice care, modifier GW should be used to indicate that a service is not related to the hospice patient's terminal condition. If you receive a claim denial and the denial code is because the patient is in hospice, you should reopen that claim with Medicare or file a corrected claim with the other payers to append modifier GW if that service is in fact unrelated to the hospice care. So the example is simple. In this case, the patient is enrolled in hospice care but is seen for their yearly exam. Append modifier GW to the service to provide the payer the information they need to pay out the claim form. Again, that goes in, or in box 24D, just to the right of the procedure code. You should not use modifier GW if the patient is no longer in hospice care, if the diagnosis is related to the hospice diagnosis, or if the professional service is related to the hospice diagnosis. Next, let's discuss modifier QW. This is an informational modifier used to let insurers know that a test is a CLIA wave test and it is added in the first modifier position. To perform the CLIA wave test, your office must first obtain a CLIA certificate. Once this has been obtained, the tests can be performed at the location the certificate is valid for. Not all tests require a CLIA certificate. One of the most commonly used tests, as an example, is the tier lab. The clinical laboratory fee schedule can be accessed to see if a QW modifier is necessary. Using the QW modifier is stating that all CLIA protocols and requirements for the particular wave test have been followed. These can be found in the manual for whatever the particular test you are doing has. Here is an example of using the QW modifier for a tier lab test. It is important to note that each payer may have a different requirement on how to set up the claim for CLIA wave tests, including using bilateral indicators over right and left modifiers. It is important to review each payer's requirements for proper claim setup. In this example, you can see the QW modifier is in the first position, followed by the indicator for which I the test was performed on. When you have received your CLIA certificate, you will also receive a 10-digit alphanumeric CLIA number. This needs reported in box 23 for any test that uses QW, even though the test is considered CLIA waived. We would never use modifier QW on any tests that are not listed on the clinical laboratory fee schedule. The modifier only should be on those tests listed in the fee schedule. It would also never be appended to an evaluation and management code. All right, thank you, Danielle. So that concludes the 10 modifiers that we wanted to discuss with you today. 
Now, I know that was a lot of information, but we hope that you've gained some valuable knowledge on when and how to use these commonly misunderstood or misused modifiers. This slide here has some of the resources that we discussed today. You'll find things like your NCCI table or that global surgery calculator linked here. Again, we will be sending out the PowerPoint slides following the presentation, so you will have access to these. We find these links very useful and believe that you will as well. And we're going to go ahead and take some questions here in just a moment. I'll give you all some time. If you've not already typed your questions into the question box, please go ahead and do so. While we're waiting on those to come in, I do want to take just a moment and let you all know a little bit more about RevCycle Partners. RevCycle Partners is a revenue cycle management company. And we specialize in providing services to the eye care industry. And our team is composed of experts who have real world experience working in eye care offices. We do offer three different services, a credentialing service, an eligibility and benefit service, and then also a billing service. Our billing service is the biggest of our three. We allow our customers to customize what portion of their billing they would like us to assist with. We can provide billing services for just medical claims, just vision claims, or both. Our services include scrubbing claims, including looking for and adding those modifiers that we just talked about. We will also do claim submissions for medical claims. We'll do claim corrections and appeals. We do post insurance payments and work your aged claims as part of our ongoing service. In addition to the ongoing billing service, we do offer AR cleanup projects for claims that would otherwise be outside of our services. If, for example, you have fallen behind on your aging and just need a little bit of help catching up, but don't want to have us take over your billing, you can sign up just for a limited time AR cleanup project. Our fees are based on net receipts. We only charge a percentage of what you were paid by the insurance company. We do not include patient copays, deductibles, or coinsurance when calculating our fees. Our medical claims for uh, billing, I'm sorry, for medical claims billing, we charge 7.5% of net medical receipts. For vision claims billing, we charge 4.25% of net vision receipts. And for AR projects, those are custom quotes based on the needs of your office. If you're interested in information about our services, I'll leave this slide up during our Q&A so you can grab our contact information. But with that, we'll go ahead. It looks like we've had a couple of questions entered in. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, here's a quick one. What does UNC mean? I apologize about that. So that is usual and customary. So that would be your normal fees, whatever you would normally bill. Uh, Danielle, so there's a question that says, I was told to put modifier 79 in the first spot instead of modifier 55, which is correct there. Um, you know, Novitas has it one way. Uh, WPS has it another way. Um, you know, I have always done modifier 55 first, followed by 79, um, since 79 is informational and 55 is your payment modifier. Um, but, you know, I, I have seen where different um, Medicare contractors have it listed differently. So I would recommend checking with your Medicare contractor, um, just since there is a little bit of, of a different answer depending on the contractor. Okay, very good. Kind of related to that, since we're on the topic of uh, post-op, another question, why is modifier 79 required when global periods are considered separate? even if it is within the global period of the previous previous surgery, if there is an RT and LT modifier? Why do you still need modifier 79 for the second eye? Modifier 79 is saying that it's an unrelated procedure. You know, the same physician is doing that. It's during that post-operative bit of period, but it is a completely unrelated procedure. We do have the right or left on there telling 
you know, the insurance payer, hey, this is a different eye, but they do want that information that, you know, it is an informational modifier saying it's completely unrelated. You know, as we mentioned, modifiers are providing additional information to insurance payers, making it so that we don't have to have a whole bunch more CPT codes than we already have. Um, so insurances have said we want this additional information to verify it is definitely unrelated. And it's not just that we've added, you know, left or right on there in error. Okay, good. Same vein, here's another question about post-op care. It says, I have been having issues getting reimbursed for post-op care. My claims that are getting denied are only from one surgeon's office. The other surgeon's office we refer our patients to are reimbursed with no denials. Sometimes we're reimbursed for one eye, not the other. It's been quite a difficult issue and it's taking a lot of necessary time. Unnecessary time, I think. Yes, uh, those can be frustrating. Um, what I would recommend is is definitely, you know, talking to your surgeon's office and verifying that they're billing with modifier 54. If they don't have that 54 and you're using the 55, then your claim isn't going to be paid. They, they do have to have that 54 on there. The other thing that can be an issue is making sure that the transfer of care information that you've received matches what the surgeon billed. Again, both your claim and the surgeon's claim have to go hand in hand, so the information has to match. Um, and it sounds like maybe that could be part of the issue. Very good. Usually a, a call to the surgeon's office to verify all of your information does clear those up. Um, all right, let's see, here's one on modifier 50. Our LT and RT modifiers used in place of 50 only when it's a unilateral code. Uh, so the answer to that is that um, modifier 50 is used in place of RT and LT when that bilateral surgery code it has an indicator of one. Sometimes you will see codes that are billed by eye care with a with a bilateral surgery indicator of three. Those you can use RT and LT with, those are, are still unilateral procedures, um, but those you would bill on two lines using RT and LT. You don't use modifier 50 for those. So it depends on what that bilateral surgery indicator is. You've got to look up the physician fee schedule on CMS's website to know if modifier 50 should be used. Okay, uh, let's see. If an OCT is performed when a 92250 or a fundus photo is, or another service, which, which gains the modifier 59? So I think that's asking if you're billing both an OCT and a fundus photo, which modify, which line, which procedure gets that modifier 59 added to it? And the answer is whichever one is in column two of the NCCI table. So when you look it up, you want to put modifier 59 on the column two code. It's been a little while since I've looked it up. I do believe that that is the 92250, but you would want to double check me there. It's, it's been a while since I've looked at that. Let's see, Danielle, modifiers are payment, informational, pricing, and what else? What is the order they should be given in again? Um, the other type of modifier is location. So you're right, left, uh, things like that. Um, you always want your payment, informational, and then location modifiers. So the way that you asked it there um, is, is how you would want those listed. All right, very good. Let's see. Um, if we are doing a concretion removal during a glaucoma check and it was not previously scheduled, would modifier 25 be correct? So if you're doing a minor surgical procedure during a glaucoma check, is modifier 25 correct? 
If it's something that was found during your process, during your glaucoma check, you know, that's our example there that, you know, we had was, I believe, foreign body removal, right? So if it's something that wasn't there before or was found during the glaucoma check needs addressed, you know, you could use modifier 25, but you do want to make sure that all of your documentation and charting, your reason for visit and everything explain that, you know, there is a reason it's being done. It is something that is necessary. It's significantly different and, and unique and identifiable from the reason the patient was scheduled to come in and their complaint for the visit. Very good. Uh, I've had a couple of questions on whether or not the PowerPoint will be delivered. It will. We will give a copy of the PowerPoint to everyone following today's uh, session. See, if doing a photo and an OCT, we cannot bill and use 59 if for the same condition, correct? So that's going to be a decision that the provider is going to have to make. You know, the, the rules are, are put in place, those NCCI edits are put in place based on, you know, a lot of different you know, experts coming together and saying that in almost all circumstances, conditions or problems can be investigated by either a photo or an OCT, that both are not needed. However, you can make the case that you need both of them for the particular condition if you believe that it has met those uh, you know, rules. So you will just need to have very clear documentation explaining what was restricted in either the photo or the OCT that would require the use of the other one and be prepared to back up your reasoning in the case of an audit. I can't, I can't tell you that it's not possible because certainly those exceptions can happen. That's why modifier 59 exists. Um, but, you know, again, the rules are there because the experts believe that those exceptions should be extremely rare. Okay, let's see. Uh, a couple more on post-op care. So for post-op care, the diagnosis from the surgeon and the optometrist have to be the same. Is that right, Danielle? Yes, the diagnosis, the CPT, and the care dates should all be the same. All right. And then for YAG, OU, both I, YAG, global billing, we have been successful submitting 66821 with modifiers 59 and RT on line one, and then 66821 with modifiers 55 and LT on line two. Only one pair, Blue Cross, I'm sorry, Blue Shield, has required billing to one line and be 66821 with modifier 50 and 55. Should we change our claims for other payers to also be 66821 on one line with modifiers 50 and 55? So it is most appropriate to bill those with RT and LT. Now, you know, each payer um, has certainly the ability to make up their own rules, right? When it comes um, to some of these modifiers and a lot of them like to do it with modifier 50 in particular. So, you know, I would contact the payer, you know, if, if you've already spoken with Blue Shield and they have said they do want it on one line with 50, modifier 50 instead of two lines with RT and LT, then I would do that for Blue Shield. I would continue to follow the 55 with RT and LT for your other payers, especially for, for Medicare. That is um, technically correct by the guidelines for, for Medicare. 
All right, now I know there are still quite a few questions. I apologize, but we are out of time and I wanna be sensitive to your time today. Um, there were a few on our services and a couple other questions on modifiers. Any unanswered questions we will send the responses for um, in a follow-up email. We'll reach out to you um, if you've listed your name as your as the attendee. If it's an anonymous, we will try and put those Q&A um, in the follow-up email as well. I apologize that we weren't able to get to everyone's questions, but I do appreciate the dialogue and the active particip participation today. It was our pleasure getting to do this presentation. And again, thank you to uh, Pekka for allowing us to host. We hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day today and a wonderful week. Thanks for attending.